Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This episode is the conclusion of a roundtable discussion of the risk management framework regarding Step 1, categorization, specifically focused on industrial control systems. Since this first step is the most important in the process, we presented this review in a multi-part series. This particular podcast will discuss the roles and responsibilities as well as the operating environment. In the last slide, we talked about understanding the security objectives to your environment and how they're the crossroads to mission success. But to really understand that, that the, the security objectives, it requires specific roles and specific responsibilities within your operating environment mm -hmm. and, and really understanding what they are. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if we all want to get to that light at the end of the tunnel, which in the controlled environment with these new requirements, that's all we're looking for, right? We now understand it's not an ATO. And what it really is, is the development of a security program. Well, Dr. Hollington has professed on many occasions that a security program is people, processes, and technology. And without accurately identifying the people, their role and responsibilities, you have no security program. It doesn't exist. So, so who is the security program? Who is it? Yeah, it's a very good question. The security program is a culmination of individuals who interact with, either internally or external, with this information system. Another way of looking at it is all individuals responsible for supporting the mission by way of this information system. The impact of that particular person um, and how they support the mission is directly correlated to the impact of the information they're either using or they're protecting. We already know what those impact levels of that information is from our previous discussion on those previous slides. And we also now understand the security objective. So it's now important to identify these individuals and educate them as to what their role in not just implementing the operational themes of the mission, but also implementing the security functions to support that operation. There are two, two things that I want you to expand upon. Okay. The first is you, you, you talk about uh, people or anyone interacting with the system yeah. internally or externally. Absolutely. Can you talk to me a little bit about the internal. Okay, well the internal, most information system environments understand this. You know, they see these people on a daily basis. They interact with these people on a daily basis. These are your system administrators. You can't get a user account unless you interface with that system administrator. This is your program manager responsible for identifying requirements or are, are, are funding in order for your mission to take place or your system to be supported. Uh, this is your user group, uh, the community of individuals who actually implement your system on a daily basis. We see these people, they're internal to our everyday and, and we're very aware of them, right? We, we know how they, um, how they utilize the system, we know their importance. External, yeah. that's a little different. Uh, not all individuals internal to the system are privy uh, to the external users. Um, in some situations, we see external users as service providers. Um, some service providers have direct interaction or should say direct connectivity to the information systems. Um, uh, certain information providers provide computer network defense. Some of them, some of them provide auditing services to us. Um, as in, in a control system environment, you'll have vendors that come on site and do routine maintenance. They'll do uh, expansions of your, infra of your control systems to new buildings. Uh, they're external to your information system. However, they are still critical and they also have a role in order for your information system to support its mission. Now, let's think about the previous slide again. The information and those information types that we identified that these vendors are now either introducing to your environment and or manipulating or using has to be protected because without this information, your system can't meet its mission. So it is now imperative that during step one, you not only identify who these external entities are, but you understand what their role is inside of your security program. How does this individual support the requirement that implements and supports your security objectives. 
and, and it's and it's it's critical, especially mm -hmm. in a control system environment, mm -hmm. to understand those uh, external users because there may be some specific requirements that they need to uh, remote into your system. Yeah, that may require you to put additional auditing um, mechanisms or in place, authentication mechanisms. Or that, right, yeah. which which may have to raise an impact level. This is true. Of whether it's confidentiality this or integrity, true. right? Very true. Um, so so. The, the external user has also has a role mm. with determining the impact levels on your system. You know what, you bring up such a, a, a good uh, point there. Uh, I've seen control environments where the procurement process resulted in having a very specific vendor where the environment wasn't a mix of different vendors, same technology, but just one. And that vendor, uh, have proprietary information where if the particular component or components were not able to meet a DOD requirement, having that information exposed publicly could harm that vendor's bottom line. And thus having other maintenance crews come in and get privy to that information uh, could be counterproductive to that vendor. And thus this information that belongs to that information system owner, it's vulnerability information, but this vendor doesn't want released and is willing to support and is supporting through some type of maintenance agreement has to be protected, right? Um, so yeah, considering what that role, that understanding that this vendor does have a role and then considering various information types and making sure that they're categorized properly and querying this particular person throughout this process of RMF for various needs, right? Through categorization, we just talked about. But later on in our, pre, in our further discussions, we might start talking about implementation and so on and so forth, is key. And here during step one is where we identify not only those individuals, but also their role and what part of our mission they are responsible for. Great, great. And, and when we look at, we look at the, the the responsibilities and the roles mm -hmm. of and, and anyone interacting or any individual interacting with the system has a responsibility to it. Sure. Which role do you think is the most influential oh. in this entire process? Absolutely. Uh, the most influential role without question is the system owner. And why is that? The system owner is ultimately responsible for conveying and communicating what the operating environment is, period. And out of this operating environment of this common understanding of what that mission is and how the system should operate falls your security program, falls the technology needed in order to support it, falls the people, um, the training, and also the processes in order to operate. It all starts and ends with the system owner. The system owner acts as that bridge between the program manager and the systems manager of what you need, what requirements are going to be put in place as well as the system administrator and the, uh, the system users as they're going to operate that system on a daily basis. Lastly, the system owner under RMF has a very important function of communicating risk. That system owner is responsible for having someone come into the environment and evaluating this information system and their processes and technology to a particular standard. That standard is your security baseline, and that baseline is developed by your information system owner. So if the evaluation is off, it's the system owner who says, hey, 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 that was the wrong evaluation. I want somebody else to come in. And whatever that risk looks like as it goes up the tiers is a communication of not the evaluator or the user or the sysadmin. It's a communication of the system owner's perspective of how this system is operating and the perceived risk that it's operating with. Right, right. And, and you mentioned tiers there a second ago. Yeah, I did. Um, and, and within this risk management framework, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's broken down into these three tiers, tier one, two, and three. Yeah. And tier three is where your system owner functions at. Yeah. Um, his role and responsibility um, as a system owner is to respond to the direction and the guidance that's put out from tier two. Mm -hmm. And then the tier two is responsible for developing a, a policy mm -hmm. to make sure that tier one's strategic vision can be implemented. Yeah. Um, where does tier two fit in this role and responsibility within RMF? 
Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, at times, we look at tier three as uh, NIST has it laid out as being the information system layer. And, but it's important for us to understand that even at this layer, the perspective of the federal government is that the AO, uh, which typically sits in, in some organizations in their major command, uh, is at tier three. Uh, that tier two is, is of the perception that the agency or the higher order organization, be it an army or say DOD, is sitting at tier two. Um, and so you can see quickly or very easily in a federal environment that if tier two is my army or my agency or you know defense health agency or, or some higher or order organization, then the instructions and the policies that flow down from tier two uh, is what these AOs or, or what the system owner and AOs and those commands are trying to respond to. But what you can quickly see is that there's a gap between the development of a policy that is supposed to cover a very large area of responsibility and the individual implementation of each AO uh, to meet said policy. You know, for instance, you will see uh, that CAC authentication is required. Let's just keep it extremely simple. Well, when the AO looks at this information systems that uh, he's accountable for said risk, every system doesn't implement CAC or can't implement CAC in order to meet its mission. It's not a part of their operational need, right? It's counterproductive. But there's a policy for it that's set at tier two. And so at tier three, where the AO sits or where that command sits or whatnot responsible to this policy, there has to be some type of development uh, in place in order to bridge that, uh, in order for the system owners who truly understand their operating environment to meet the intent of tier one strategy, meet the policy of tier two, and meet the risk tolerance level of their AO that sits at tier three. Right, and, and, and I think that um, some of the things that I've seen mm -hmm. with uh, the tiered approach to this risk management framework mm -hmm. is that between tier two and tier three, mm -hmm. that gap that you spoke about mm -hmm. really doesn't enable the system owner to provide an operating picture of mm -hmm. his environment because he spends a lot of time trying to fit into this triangle with this square peg, this round peg. Very, right? very true. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and control systems mm -hmm. happen to be exactly one of them. Yeah, um, yeah, they do. They, they're, they're trying to make these control systems fit this construct, mm -hmm. which the control system doesn't have, and there's not a lot out there mm -hmm. from tier two mm -hmm. to provide direction guidance mm -hmm. um, to tier three on how to approach uh, IAVA or vulnerability management mm -hmm. from a control system environment. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the system owners, mm -hmm. this is where they have the opportunity. And this is, this is one of the reasons why I, I really agree with you that the system owner is the most influential role in this process. Okay. Who understands his environment more? Mm. No one. Yeah. No one understands the environment better than the system owner. Yeah. So the system owner, in the absence or the lack of that, that guidance or in the gap that's there, mm -hmm. the system owner fills that gap mm -hmm. with his operating environment. Yeah. You can't, he should not go out or she should not go out mm -hmm. and copy and paste something for mm -hmm. an ATL. Yeah. Fill the gap mm -hmm. with understanding of how you intend on operating. Yeah. This will help tier to mm. be able to understand and provide across the board yeah. what's needed for each one of those control system environments. So with that, I think uh, we have pretty much summed up what the roles and responsibilities look like, what their importance are, um, where to find them, uh, what is tier one, what is tier two and tier three, and how do they interact and how do they influence us? Any closing thoughts, Dr. Holland? Well, I, I think it's important that um, no one gets overlooked in this process. No. Um, if, they're, if they're involved in the operation of the system, if they're involved with using the data, um, you must speak with them because everybody, everybody within the operating environment has a responsibility and they have a role mm -hmm. within uh, the successful execution of RMF mm -hmm. for your operating environment. On the last slide, we talked about roles and responsibilities. Yeah. Um, and we talked about how that impacted the operating environment. Sure. So, Stephen, can you give us a, 
a, a little summation of what the operating environment is. And yeah, from what we've talked about, I mean, we've seen the operating environment as it, as it adheres to the system security program. We know you can't have a program if you don't understand your operating environment. We've identified information types. Once you truly understand it and what information types are important to you, we've looked at those. And we've also talked about their impact levels. Right, and we talked about the protection mechanism that you put in place True. specific to your operating environment. 100%. Which makes them unique. Mm. And it's not a one size fit all, right? No, it's not a one size fit all. And Dr. Hollington, you know, we've taken that and looked at your security objectives. And now the system owner, standing in the crossroads, understanding its operating environment, understanding his mission, now has to make the determination of whether or not to keep the security objectives at that level or elevate them, right? We've also looked at roles and responsibilities. And we know that your operating environment, as Dr. Hollington has explained, that includes the external entities and internal entities are key in identifying what you need to do and who needs to do it. And lastly, we're just summing this whole thing up. Making sure that you truly understand that a control system is not cookie cutter. That you cannot take an information systems security program for say an IT network or a uh, web server application farm and plug that into a control system security program and believe you're going to operate. It won't go one for one. As Dr. Hodgson explained, a security control system or an automated building uh, system is very unique. So in short, I believe we understand now that starting RMF uh, is not as daunting as one would think. Uh, that step one is to understand your operating environment. That your goal at the end of this, your light at the end of the tunnel, is not an ATO. No, it's not. It's to develop a security program. Mm -hmm. And if you develop a security program and operate in accordance with your security program as it is approved by your authorizing official, mm -hmm. and you document how well you're doing it, then um, an ATO will follow. And it will continue to follow and follow. So we thank you for joining us today with this roundtable discussion. We look forward to you joining us on the next series of roundtable discussion. Um, and y'all have a wonderful day. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www.csiac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you. Did you know that CSIAC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars.